Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. In this day and age, children need to get outside more. Family camping is probably one of the greatest ways to bring your family together. The people are coming to the Lano, and so you need to be able to educate people on the right way to take care of it so that we can all enjoy it. I used to ask them why there's so much trash on the beach. Then they flew to the moon, and the trash was still on the beach. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. As on most weekends, Ryan Spencer is packing for a trip. We do about 36 weekends a year. You could call it a mission trip. I work out of a trailer and we go all over the state. It's a unique office, but I really love it. Ryan travels to win converts, but his mission is not a religious one. You might say he's an outdoor evangelist. I go from park to park and show people how to go camping for the first time. I'm an outdoor education specialist at Texas Parks and Wildlife, and uh, I specialize in getting people outside and uh, connecting them with nature. Today, Ryan is at Blanco State Park. Thank y'all for coming out. Introducing some families to camping on behalf of the Texas Outdoor Family Program. Studies have shown that children who spend time outside are healthier, happier, and stronger that they do better in school, and they have better family cohesion. So that means that children who spend more time with their parents outside become nicer teenagers when they grow up. So they're all good reasons, but we're gonna try to make it easy for you. We're gonna go through each item. We teach about leave no trace and how to protect the environment when you're out there enjoying it. We wanna give them some skills that they can repeat on their own when they come back to the state park. So things like cooking on a camp stove, setting up a tent. We'll just unfold this thing like so. We've got a series of aluminum poles. And we'll just lay it through there. Watching carefully are Karenia Holloway, her mother Karen, and friend Isaiah. The Holloways have only camped once before. The first camping trip I did was back in December, and that was all new for me. And, and we had a blast, and I really enjoyed it. My daughter's kind of a natural at it. She just likes you know, being outdoors, which draws me in. And we're enjoying today. I was talking to Karenia and she asked me if I wanted to go. Right. And you know, my initial reaction was no. He didn't want to go camping. If something crawled on him, he was out. I, I like being inside with the AC, but you know, getting out here now, it, it, it just, it feels good. We need one more. Young neighbor Calvin has also been invited along and he's pretty excited to spend his first night in the outdoors. He's been very excited today. It's really hard to keep him still. Setting up the tent, I mean, he's just jumped right in there. You need help? When he first pulled out all the stuff, it was a little intimidating. It's there. It wasn't that difficult. Perfect. Yep. You're not alone. You know, you can do this. And if you need help, ask for help. There you go. You got the strongest man on the job, though. <laughs> this actually gives you a time to come together and just talk to one another and just experience life together. And so that's something that we don't always get the opportunity to do. Other campers are here for similar reasons. We thought this would be a great way to kind of get the kids outside of the house, uh, away from the technology, the iPads, uh, television, and realizing being outdoors, having some fun outside can be a great way to spend the weekend. Like a, trade a little technology can help the transition. Do you know what GPS stands for? Does anybody know? There's two spheres of thought. One is that we pluck kids away from technology completely, 
and the other is that we kind of ease them into it. Fun day today. I'm kind of a fan of the latter. What we do is what we call modern day treasure hunt. Geocaching, for example. There's a bunch of satellites up in the sky to actually relay your exact location and coordinates onto this thing. This one goes north. Technology may tend to keep us indoors, but geocaching combines gadgets with outdoor exploration. So you're close. It says what? Four feet. Ah, oh, they already found it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it is. I like going around and finding stuff with the GPS. It's right in this area. Kevin really enjoyed the geocaching and just even seeing what's out here was really nice. He was on the hunt for something. <laughs> it has to be one of these plants. Oh! You found it! Everyone loves a treasure hunt. Where'd it go? regardless of the treasure itself. What is it? I don't know, it's a piece of paper. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We spent a nice chunk of time locating a couple of things and the kids enjoyed finding a little treasure. By afternoon, the cool Blanco River is calling. Yippee do, sir. And there's another way to enjoy the water. Kayak. Paddling a kayak is a new experience for Calvin. Yes, sir. Can I get a high five? <laughs> That's what's up. Right. At first, he didn't want to do it, but after we got in the boat, smooth sailing, you know, he was all for it. Yeah, Calvin, that's good. Going up the river, <laughs> down the river, yeah, pretty cool. Uh oh. We were out one direction, then we were out another direction, and finally my daughter said, Mom, just put your paddle down, just sit and relax. I really like being in the water because it's really serene, it's kind of peaceful, but it's hard to kind of steer. I tried. <laughs> they ran into us. I don't know if you saw that collision. <laughs> but after that, it was pretty good. It was just something I had never done before, so maybe if I do it a few more times, maybe it will finally get through to my brain what to do exactly. <laughs> but I had fun. Never done kayaking before, this was the first time uh, so it's a little bit hesitant. I don't know if he was going to like it or not, and uh, he enjoyed it. And there are more firsts for the Folgar family, who hail from a place where camping doesn't come naturally. From New York City. The closest I've been to camping was uh, in 2004, we had a blackout. <laughs> but the lack of experience doesn't keep Aiden from catching his first fish. First one ever. It's a pretty cool fish, Aiden. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Of course, a fish is not guaranteed for every family. What am I doing wrong? But some guidance is always available. <laughs> We're gonna go one direction. That was something completely new for me, you know? going out there and really trying to work at it casting it. You make it look really easy. You have to really just get it right there when you're you clicking the button, but that was fun, and so I would do that again. I would. I didn't reel in the gator, but you know, maybe next time. When I was a kid, I grew up in the concrete jungle known as Dallas, Fort Worth. I spent most of my life there, and we spent a lot of time just in the city. And my dad uh, sat us down and said, well, you guys are gonna get outside. So he decided right then and there that he was going to make a commitment to me and my brother to go camping all the time. We went camping every single month for seven years as a family. And so I developed this real love for getting outside, and we're still very, very close, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we like camping so much. What time is it? A weekend is over quickly. Oh, darn. So one outing may not make lifelong campers. We want to leave the poles where they are. We make it easy for folks uh, to come out and try it for the first time. We want to make sure that you let it dry out. We try to take the scariness away from camping. And we're just going to drop it in. Thank you very much. I'm going to try one weekend can the introduce the simple of the joys of getting outdoors together. They show you how to camp. We're highly satisfied with what the Texas Outdoor Families did for our family. We just try to make sure that the experiences that they have with us, and they have the confidence to go out and do on their own again. Uh, the next time I do this, because you know, there will be a next time I enjoyed it that much, I'm going to bring some insect repellent. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, definitely we'll try it again, definitely. My wife, she's eager to, to be a part of this as well. All right, we got everybody. 
Oh, you gotta look at me. Look at me. I hope to bring like more people the next time that haven't done it, just so they can experience it. It's nice to do something different and uh, and have some nice time out with the family and friends. I'm the one who has to put everything away. Everything had a place, and now it's basically just like we'll probably try it again sometime uh, throughout the summer. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I think he'll always have this memory. He's had a great outing. I've been so blessed to get to help connect kids with nature and with their families. That's what it's all about for me. Families had a blast. All the stuff's back in the trailer. It's a good day. So with the last family packed up, Ryan's tent revival heads to its next state park. It, it revitalizes you to get to see all of these families come together in our state parks because that's what these parks are here for. To see a calendar of upcoming workshops near you, visit our website and join the Texas Outdoor Family Congregation. South Mount is their lifeblood. It's one of the purest rivers, uh, unspoiled rivers left in Texas. Yeah, perfect. You can't catch these in an ugly place. They just live in the most beautiful places in the world, certainly in Texas. The river can help this little town, and it's a beautiful little town. I think there's more and more recognition in this state that water is becoming a scarce resource. The people are coming to the Llano, and so you need to be able to educate people on the right way to take care of it so that we can all enjoy it. This dry wash you see here is the site of Llano Spring and where it used to flow into the blue hole on the Llano. <coughs> the ongoing drought has taken a toll on the spring. Enough water for the dog anyway. But on the east bank of the river, the springs are still flowing, and the Vandivers take that as a good sign of the land management practices they've used over the years. Extensive cedar clearing, prescribed burns, oh, 130 or so header dams, grazing practices. Even with the severity of the drought we've been dealing with, I'm absolutely sure that we're in better condition than we would have been if we hadn't done these stewardship practices. And that's the message behind the South Llano Watershed Alliance, comprised of landowners like the Vandivers and stakeholders from numerous organizations. The alliance is dedicated to preserving and enhancing the river and adjoining watersheds by encouraging land and water stewardship through collaboration, education, and community participation. It's a heck of a lot cheaper to keep a watershed and a river flowing before it goes bad than to try to fix it after it deteriorates. Holding workshops for landowners along the Llano and opening a new paddling trail are two of the major educational tools for the Alliance. Paddling trails seem to be a good way to publicize how long the trip was going to take and what type of equipment was needed and also guard the property rights of the landowners along the river. Property that's for sale along the river is now advertised in the paper as being on the paddling trails like that's a benefit and a plus. Today, a group of experts float the Llano to take note of where the river needs help. There's just not enough native grasses allowed to grow to the height and density that they should be to hold overland flow back. We're about to go through our study site. You'll see the little flags up on the bank. I hope that the Alliance can have a strong grassroots initiative in the community. I think that they have a great partnership and a great network with a lot of the locals. But I think one of their, their proudest moments is with the Oasis wildfire that we had. In April 2011, a lightning strike burned nearly 10,000 acres of riparian and upland habitat along the Llano River. So the concern from this fire was what was going to happen to this land after it, how it could recover, if it could recover. The answer was a demonstration workshop put on by the Alliance for more than 80 landowners affected by the wildfire. They were shown man-made exclosures and natural exclosures to protect new growth from browsing, cedar-slashed terracing and fiber rows to stop erosion, even special seed mix developed for scorched land. What we are seeing is vegetation coming back from the roots and from seeds. So the good news of all this is that the land is starting to recover. We realize that part of our tourism dollars here 
It's not just hunting anymore, it's all the other things that you can do in a beautiful country like this. Paddling and fishing, the fishing in this river is great. You have your nesting birds, you have your tadpole, baby fish, big grasses filtering runoff from the land. Good stewardship equals good habitat, which equals good water resources. And water resources are good not only for a piece of land like ours, but they're good for everybody in the state of Texas. Getting one neighbor to talk to another neighbor on how to have a healthy riparian habitat is going to be your greatest chance of success. They're very unique in that they are the only one alliance of this sort. And with cooperation comes hope. It was a, a beautiful, pristine hill country spring and uh, was the pride of this ranch and we can't help but believe that it'll come back. As a little kid, I used to ask him why there's so much trash on the beach. He said, cause it keeps coming in, it's too big a job, we can't get it off. Then they flew to the moon and the trash was still on the beach and that didn't suit me. Good morning to you and thank you. Thanks for getting us here. This is the annual Big Shell Beach Cleanup on Padre Island National Seashore. What's broke on that trailer? Fishing guide Captain Billy Sanderfer organized this grassroots effort in 1995. I know that we're working over 400 now. Since then, a lot of folks... We decided we wanted to. Why not, you know, help out. ...have picked up a lot of trash. So we now have 2,036,000 pounds of trash removed from our beach. The Big Shell Beach Cleanup on Padre Island happens every March. There are other opportunities for you to volunteer and make a difference. The Adopt a Beach program, organized by the General Land Office, cleans up beaches along the entire Texas coast twice a year. Another type of cleanup targets Texas bays. Right, We're out here picking up crab traps. We've got a whole bunch of volunteers. These traps can be a hazard to boaters and are also especially harmful to wildlife that become imprisoned or entangled in them. These abandoned traps attract crabs and fish, plus they can wind up in people's propellers. It adds up over time. If you don't get out here once a year, get these traps out of here, you have a lot of abandoned traps that are out there. At this point in time, we picked up over 124 crab traps. It's a shame that much waste is getting left behind just because someone doesn't care or, or doesn't want to put the money or effort or time into, into going back and retrieving. If we weren't doing it every year, it's a mess. They know that their hard work is paying off. They can see the visual evidence. They've had fun getting wet. Protecting habitats is an important part of coastal conservation. Creation of habitats is another. The Riggs Reefs program gives the oil and gas companies the opportunity to take the existing platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, which are reefs as they exist right now, donate them to the state as an eternal reef for the Gulf of Mexico. The platforms are obsolete. Rather than being cut up for scrap, the underwater structure is left in place. These are platforms that have reached the end of their economic life. The reserves have been depleted. There's no more oil and gas production. These structures provide a habitat that teems with life. The fish really go to that structure. They're just covered in fish all year long.
There's about four different user groups that use the platforms. There's recreational divers, recreational fishermen, charter fishermen, and commercial fishermen all use the platforms after they've been left in place. Hey, that's deeper. Over 100 oil rigs have been donated to the program, allowing all parties to benefit. We believe that there are ways for industry and environment to coexist and benefit, and the Rigs to Reef is just a marvelous example. The structure the rigs provide benefit many creatures. Oh, man. One in particular is red snapper. There's a fish on there. Red snapper certainly is one of the species that has been impacted by artificial reefs. <laughs> artificial reefs and oil and gas platforms have, have played a role in their expansion as well as uh, their rebuilding. So you need some help with that? No, that's okay. If I can't get them in, I don't deserve them. Since the late 1980s, when red snapper was probably at its lowest level, we've probably seen abundance increase from two to 300 percent now. Oh, look at that. Gorgeous fish. It's his birthday. Oh, yeah. My birthday. Where's the party at? I don't know. There are many things that you can do to help our bays, estuaries, and the Gulf of Mexico. It doesn't matter if you live right on the coast or 400 miles away, your actions do have an impact. We can all be part of the solution. When we use native plants, for example, in our landscapes, we reduce the amount of herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers that we put on our landscapes. And those chemicals go through our rivers and our streams and ultimately reach the ocean. All that trash that ends up on the beaches and in our oceans, it came from somewhere. So when we drink from plastic bottles, we need to be responsible with that plastic and either recycle it or use reusable containers so we don't contribute to that trash that's in the ocean. The choices we make, the actions we take, all have real consequences far beyond what we often imagine. We hope you'll come join us to come steward your waters. We have state parks and wildlife management areas where you can help volunteer. Come join us as we clean up a beach with the general land office. Join a conservation organization, the CCA, Ducks Unlimited, Audubon, the Nature Conservancy. All of those opportunities are there for you to help support your Gulf of Mexico. Individuals are really the key to changing the world. Individuals acting first with their own ideas, but then joining forces with others and make big things happen. We got to worry about the next generation. Sure. If we don't be concerned about what happens down the road, then what happens down the road won't be anything. Never before have we had the need to understand that we now have, because we're on the edge of so many great issues. Never again, perhaps, will we have such a good chance to solve these problems. This is a moment, not just as never before, but maybe as never again, to have hope to make the world a better place. They're starting to come in like right now. There's like layers upon layers of them. They come in on um, on the same trees every day. They migrate after July's over.
They're getting closer, like really close. Last weekend's estimate was 400,000, but you know, I don't know a way, you know, once you get over several thousand birds to really estimate. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.